So today we're going to take a look at the Game Boy that I got in the handheld lot from eBay, the one that came with the Game Gear and the Game Boy, both billed as not having working screens. And, uh, well, it turns out that the Game Boy screen actually does work. And if you look here from the pickups video clip, it plays games as well, too. So I'm not sure why they thought it didn't work. Maybe they didn't have any good batteries or maybe they didn't have anything to test with. I'm not sure. By the way, I'm doing a voiceover because the original audio was really bad. There was buzzing in the background and clips and stuff like that. I'm not sure why I have to investigate. So I'm just doing this voiceover. So there might be some silence. I'm going to try to put some music in between. Uh, try to, you know, carry it on. But basically, I'm just going over the Game Boy itself. I have an example on screen of, you know, what it looks like when there's damaged lines on the screen. This Game Boy does not suffer from that at all. Testing it out again so that you can see that it does work, that the screen does work. But again, as you can see, I'm going to uh, adjust the contrast wheel a bit, but you can see that there are no missing lines on the screen at all. The screen works fine. So we're going to go ahead and proceed with basically taking this guy apart with a tri-wing blade screwdriver. And there are six screws, and I'm going to do like a little speed through. And now you can see uh, I'm going to slowly separate the two halves because there is a ribbon that connects the front half of the console to the back. The front half basically contains the screen and the PCB that also has the buttons on it. The back half has the actual brains, the CPU, the memory, cartridge slot, and all of that. So we're going to carefully separate it. We're going to remove the ribbon cable and get a better look at the inside, see how dirty it is, see if there's any damage, things like that. And it looks like, you know, there are some critters inside of here, and there does look to be a little bit of a possible liquid spillage in there around the speaker area. We'll get a closer look later on, but it's the critters that kind of gross me out a little bit. Yeah, just like I said, it's really gross. I probably should have worn gloves. Yeah, maybe in, maybe next time. But yeah, as you can see now, these are the two halves separated. Um, just going over again what each half of the Game Boy does so that, you know, you guys kind of have an idea of it and everything. And I'm also talking about uh, screen replacement kits and how the front PCB is basically replaced with a new one. So a new button board effectively to accommodate the new LCD screen. Otherwise, it doesn't look like anyone's really been in here, at least uh, not to do any work or anything. I'm just making note that there's some excess flux, most likely from the factory. And now I'm just going to prepare to remove the rest of the screws out of the main PCB and the little soundboard at the bottom there. And now I'm just showing the inside, pointing out what the CPU is. And the CPU, by the way, is kind of a derivative of a Z80 and an Intel 8088. And I'm also putting out the uh, memory the RAM for the video and the system overall. The uh, crystal oscillator for the CPU, power button, expansion port cover that I'm struggling to take off. And I don't even think it was ever removed before. So not I don't know of any people myself that played multiplayer Game Boy games, so, oh well. But looking over the board itself again, no damage traces, no leaky capacitors. I don't see any actual liquid damage to the board itself, the DC board, everything's, everything looks fine. So that's, that's very good news. So it still confuses me as to why they thought it didn't work. And here I'm basically just going over the second half of the Game Boy, the, uh, the button board, the LCD display. So 10 screws total here that have to be removed. Uh, not too difficult to remove. Another little critter underneath that ribbon cable, which again, this thing is gross. I really should have put gloves on, but it is what it is. Speakers gunked up. Definitely something spilled on here. Not sure what it was just yet. When I was cleaning it later on, I think it was coffee or Coke or something. But the board itself removes very easily. Uh, again, uh, just initial look, no bad 
capacitors, no broken traces or anything like that. And now, you know, I'm just examining the ribbon just to make sure it looks good. But the interesting thing about this, if you do end up having those lines missing in your screen, relatively easy to fix. You take a hot starting iron, no more than 300 degrees Celsius, maybe even lower than that. But you take the iron, just run it across, you know, where I'm pointing to right now. And you got to have the system connected and on so you can see. You just go over it and you'll start seeing those lines disappear. You'll see other lines start to appear and then disappear again. What you're basically doing is reheating the solder, reflowing it so that it remakes contact. And that should help restore the screen. It doesn't always work. And if you do it too long or too hot, you run the risk of melting that ribbon. So be very careful with it. If you're not sure, find a trusted friend that knows how to solder or, you know, maybe even a professional. So and here I'm just taking out the buttons and the membranes, making comments again that they're also kind of gross and disgusting. So. But that's it. I mean, and it's not too difficult to take a Game Boy apart. Looking at the battery contacts on the PCB are in good shape. But there's ones in the case itself that are corroded, at least the bottom two. The one in the middle at the top isn't. It's not difficult to remove them though. There's little tabs you push in and then push down on the battery contacts themselves and they'll just pop out. Uh, that's what I'm basically doing now so that they just come out easily. And again, they're not that difficult to remove. Showing off some corrosion, I'm just going to basically spray some vinegar on there and clean it with a couple of brushes just to, at the very least, just stop the corrosion from getting worse. The ones that I did for the Game Gear, the entire nickel or whatever coating that's on these was just worn away. They're just copper plates underneath, which is unfortunate because of the fact that the copper will start to corrode again over time. I... I was talking about maybe using the Game Boy tabs as replacement for the Game Gear ones, but the Game Boy ones don't have soldering tabs on there, so. And as far as the rest of this case, I'm gonna just have to basically soak them. There's a crack on there, unfortunately, that I can't do much with. And there's super glue around. I'm hoping I can get rid of it. I don't know if I'm going to be able to. And I'm showing here how the actual crack shows up. I'm trying to get it to focus. It's a lot worse now that I took a closer look at it than I did, it's what it is. I discovered how it happened. They glued the uh, screen lens back on, they pushed down, cracked the case, cracked the screen lens. Fortunately, they didn't crack the screen. And it's a real shame too, because the shell is in great shape. Otherwise, if it wasn't for the super glue and that crack, it's a little yellowed. Now our Retrobrite would probably get it back to the original. It's, it's that stupid glue in the crack that there's not much that I'll be able to do with it, really. You remove the uh, cartridge shielding. Taking everything apart is, like I said, it's not too difficult, but there are a lot of steps. Making a note of all the screws where they go, because I'm going to clean it, and I will end up reassembling this at the end just to make sure cleaning it didn't damage anything, didn't break anything. I'm not going to show cleaning at all on screen because that's kind of boring. And everyone knows how to clean stuff, so. And here, but everything's clean. Battery, cover, you know, that was, you know, pretty easy to clean. I did off camera also clean the PCBs with just a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. It took me a while to clean the gunk off of the speaker, but I did manage to get it clean. You will see later at the end that it does still work, so that's good. The other thing is this nail polish NJ initials that were painted on the back. Acetone will remove it, but acetone will also eat through the plastic. Same thing with the super glue on the front. Bottom half is fine. Bottom half of the shell, again, if I can get rid of those initials in the back, I can still use it in the future. In case I buy a busted Game Boy, maybe it's got a cracked back shell or something, but the front's good, I can use it. Silicon pad here. It's basically shredded. I'm going to have to replace that. You can buy replacements, fortunately. But it's only the one for the D-pad. The rest are in good shape. But when you buy the kit, you have to replace them all, which Again, extra spare parts, so. The uh, the buttons themselves are in good shape otherwise. A little wear and tear, but that's to be expected. So I'm just going to start putting it back together, make sure everything works uh, after cleaning it, make sure I didn't scratch anything, break anything. 
physically, obviously, with the shell and the buttons, you know, they're fine. I'm more concerned with the electronics, so... Getting the uh, battery contacts, the shield. We're going to put everything back in. And I'm just looking to see how the battery contacts go back in because uh, they only fit one way properly. Now they, and I, and I make mention this in the video, but of course because of the bad audio, you know, you won't be able to hear it, but the battery contacts are actually labeled W1 and W2. W1 is the one that goes to the top middle and W2 are the two bottom contacts and I end up discovering that. So make note of that if you're taking your original Game Boy apart, W2 goes in the bottom, W1 goes at the top. And then the next step is to reattach the uh, cartridge RF shield. I don't know how necessary it actually is, but if you want your system to be complete, put it back on. And I'm doing kind of like a, a, a test fit slash putting it back into the casing. You have to uh, be careful how you reinstall the power board, their actual grooves in the side of the case where they fit into. And then the soundboard just kind of sits on top. There's a little recessed area where the headphone jack kind of sinks into a bit. And there's just, again, the four screws, two to hold the main board in, and then two to hold the soundboard in. The rest of the board is held together by the case screws. So don't worry. Again, remember, when you put the screw in, slowly twist it counterclockwise until you kind of hear a click and feel the screw kind of fall in place. That way you're not re-treading it and potentially stripping the screw mount, which could be bad in the future because you won't be able to reattach that screw. So the uh, speaker itself is keyed to fit a notch in the opening, so make sure that it lines up. Otherwise, you won't be able to close the shell. We'll reattach the button board LCD driver board back into the front half of the shell. Ten screws, remember. And there is one specific hole. You'll see it under the ribbon that uh, it's not a screw hole. Behind that is the LCD screen. If you put a screw in there, the screen's going to be damaged. There's even a little graphic silk screen onto it that specifically says no screw. So... Switching over to B-roll just to get a slightly different angle so you're not just staring straight down the entire time. Plus you can't see a reattached a ribbon cable from the top angle anyway, so I figured I'd switch it up a little bit just to give a different vantage point. The ribbon is a little difficult to put back in, but here <laughs> I'm realizing that I forgot to put the buttons back in. So I am... Uh, I'm basically uh, going to have to take the entire LCD driver board again. So I'm just going to skip ahead and uh, not show me taking those screws back out. Again, learn from my mistakes. So, And, the, and the, the, the funny thing is that they're sitting right there next to me. The membranes are there, the buttons are there, and it didn't dawn on me. It's like, huh, I wonder what these are for. Until after the fact, of course. So I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of the buttons put in. And here, I'm going to switch again to the B-roll just to get a different vantage point. Sorry that it's at a kind of a strange angle, but I really couldn't get the camera angled any differently. And I realized that I forgot the uh, power on switch cover and I go look for it. And I remember that the day before 
kind of flew out when I took the console apart and I never found it. I don't know where it went. I checked the trash can under the desk. I could not find it. So fortunately I'm replacing the shell, which will hopefully come with a new power switch cover. So, but it won't stop you from turning it on. You just have to stick like a screwdriver or something inside to flip the switch itself since it's recessed in and you won't be able to actually get into it. Not a big deal for, for this purpose, again, for testing. Now I'm just going to reattach the back half of the shell. Six screws, and these are the tri-wings again, so remember that uh, you need a tri-wing, and that's what I'm remembering here. I believe I was using a Y3, just so that you're aware. A Y2 should work as well. I wouldn't go smaller than that. I wouldn't go larger than the Y3. If you go too small, you end up stripping the screw in the bit. If you go too large, you'll end up stripping the screw itself, so the screw head. Here, I'm putting the expansion port cover back on. Really excited about that, because again, anyone that's trying to buy a used Game Boy Online, they usually don't have them. They don't even have battery covers half the time, so... Give me some batteries. We're going to test Metroid 2 just again, just to make sure it's working, make sure I didn't damage anything because I definitely have a habit of making things worse sometimes. And I just realized that my cartridge shell is cracked. I don't know if I realized it when I picked it up or not, but whatever. I think I paid a few bucks for it, so no big deal. It does work. Sound does work. Again, you can't hear it because of the bad audio. The audio's working. The game's obviously playing. The buttons do seem to work, except for the fact that the D-pad is a little mushy because of the broken uh, silicon pad underneath. Uh, uh, so if you do experience mushy buttons on your original Game Boy, or even original controllers in general, whether they're NES, SNES, Genesis, whatever, check the membranes out. If they're ripped, replace them. You can find them all over the place on the internet. eBay, different various vendors online, Amazon probably has them too, so... The fact that this Game Boy works overall for how little I paid for the whole lot itself is amazing, and I'm still shocked about that, so. Again, even just for the Game Boy, it was worth it. The fact that the Game Gear was kind of damaged is fine. But here I'm going to call it a wrap. Part 1, we're going to call it. And Part 2 will be the actual modding, replacing of the shell. Maybe I'll do a screen replacement. Maybe get some new buttons. We'll see. But yeah, uh, that's it. If you like the video, hit the thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, hit the thumbs down. But please leave a comment below as to why so I can use that to make improvements going forward. Oh, and I forgot. At some point over the past week, I hit 100 subs. Actually, I think I'm at 102 right now. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. I am so surprised. Thank you very much again. Otherwise, uh, thanks all. I'll catch you later in part two with the modding.